Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In this video and the next one, I'm going to talk about the the um, extremities of our planet, the poles. Uh, more specifically, I'm going to talk about the ice caps at the poles. So this video, I'll be focusing on Greenland. There's a bunch of uh, very significant papers that have come out recently. Um, uh, one in particular is arguing that the Greenland ice sheet is close to a melting point of no return, that uh, we've had 500 uh, gigatons of carbon emissions and we're halfway to a uh, major tipping point in the ice sheet. With another 500, you know, we'll lose the southern uh, parts of the ice on Greenland over time. And if we continue our business as usual, you know, and hit, uh, you know, 2,500 gigatons cumulative emissions, basically all of Greenland um, melts, melts out. That takes time, but there's seven meters of sea level embedded in Greenland alone. Um, so that's the focus of this video, talking all about Greenland. Um, there's also a significant paper that looks at um, atmospheric rivers, um, hitting Greenland. And when these atmospheric rivers carrying all this moisture move up um, in northwest Greenland, they go up, they climb up the ice and the moisture is released. And then there, so it's dry air that reaches the top and then it descends down on the east side of Greenland as a phone, so-called phone wind, um, which then causes a lot more melting of, of the um, of the ice sheet. Also, there was a paper which I talked about a um, couple months ago, just to remind you that, you know, I mean, Greenland's melting from above with higher, higher air temperatures, also from below with warmer ocean temperatures, but they're intricately connected because the paper, as I discussed, and it's in a previous video I did of Greenland, I think it was just about uh, three or four months ago, maybe five months ago, the idea is, you know, you get meltwater from Greenland um, and that water goes, can go under the ice or it can drain off the top of the ice into the ocean. And what it does is it, it, it increases the, the submarine melting. Um, and this happens even if the ocean temperature didn't rise because, you know, think of putting ice in your glass and not moving it at all, it melts out. You could time it if you like, see how long it takes to melt with a stopwatch on your iPhone or something. And then you could do the same experiment, put in the same amount of ice into water and now shake the glass. And if you shake the glass, that dynamic mixing um, removes the water that is just above the melting temperature, the, the layers next to the ice, you know, and that turbulent mixing greatly increases the loss of that ice. So that's exactly what happens with the meltwater. It incre the more meltwater there is, the more the submarine melting will be, even if the temperature of the ocean, like I said, underneath wasn't changing. But of course, we know that's warming as well. So let's get right into these uh, papers. And then in the next video, I'll talk about the other poll, some very significant work that's just come out, you know, in the last few days, actually, um, and what it's showing is that the, the, um, the, the water, um, it's all part of the ther ocean thermohaline circulation system. The deep abyssal water um, is warming significantly, and that means there's less water descending to the deep ocean floor, less overturning that weakens the whole global ocean conveyor system. And this is very, very significant because the warning is that it could actually reduce something like 40% over, over the next, uh, um, by, t by over the next 25, 26 years, you know, to 2050, it could decrease 40 cent, 40%. And this is hugely significant because the, um, the overturning is very important for marine life because water near the surface is oxygenated and that oxygen is carried down. Um, and uh, the water that comes up from deep below is very high in nutrients, so that comes up. So it's very important for marine life, both at the ocean floor that needs the oxygen and, the, and at the surface that needs the nutrients. Um, and it's also 
a huge carbon sink. You know, lots of carbon um, is in that water um, that descends to the ocean floor and then it gets locked into the sediments. Um, so it's a, it's a huge sink of carbon. And if the overturning decreases and you get more stratification of the ocean, then the CO2 levels in the atmosphere will be much, much higher. Much less CO2 will be taken out um, by the oceans. And this is very bad news for humanity. So, so that's going to be next video, Antarctica. Like I said, this video is Greenland. So let's go right into the, um, into these studies. Um, okay. So the first thing I highly recommend is, you know, get a Twitter account, you know, just get one for your climate, um, for looking at climate change. Okay. Um, and what you can do is if you go on Twitter or, um, here we go, go on Twitter, put in the hashtag Greenland, and you can look at the top and latest and, uh, you know, you find lots of sites to follow, which is good, you know, and here we, here we go. Um, you can just scroll down and let's see what, what's Greenland. Uh, you know, it's got different, uh, new world encyclopedia. I'm not following. Let's follow them. About 80% of Greenland is covered by ice. The world's second largest ice sheet after Antarctica, of course. Um, right. Different facts. Why are the massive ocean currents slowing down? This is uh, not Greenland. This is Antarctica. Somebody's got the hashtags here. The rate of turnover is slowing down. Um, multi-stability and transit response of the Greenland ice sheet. This is the bifurcation point. Okay, if you click on this, this is the how this is how you can find the paper that was just published a couple of days ago. Um, Measurements on fjord, you know, scientists post and as long as they have the Greenland hashtag, uh, you see these images, there's a helicopter and, you know, near next to fjord, Greenland, here we come, Greenland to stay in daylight savings time forever, and so on. You can get all of the, you know, stuff here. This is interesting. This is an image taken by Copernicus satellite showing the sea ice swirl at the coast of Greenland. You know, the eddies in the water and it's carrying the sea ice around. Um, somebody looking to, to study, uh, you know, lots of study. We're heading into the Northern Hemisphere summer. So lots of scientists are going up there to begin their studies. So here a drone takes off to find an opening in the ice. You know, the, these these uh, nylas or whatever openings in the ice. Um, what says spring is coming, sentinel images, diving under ice, the sick calls for a special kind of entry. There you go. You know, nice triangular hole. And uh, this is a, somebody having a bit of fun, a free diver uh, going, I don't know, they, the hashtag is for Greenland and ice diving. So, you know, maybe they're going for a little dip there. This is beautiful, Baffin Bay, Greenland, you know, beautiful ice, this, you know, ice peaks, cockpit landing in Greenland, right? You can get all kinds of, um, there's fossilized plants in Greenland under 1.4 kilometers of ice. Facts with zoom in, right? I mean, it's just, uh, here, here's some, uh, a storm uh, coming across and we're halfway to a tipping point that would trigger six feet, you know, two meters over about two meters of sea level rise. Okay. Um, some images, uh, coring ice crystal to Greenland and they cored this last year and they're analyzing the core that taking chunks out of a refrigerator and doing slices and they identify this, um, this, um, mineral, this small crystals of the rare IKT. There you go, little little crystals in the ice. So you can see, you know, it's really kind of fun to to follow this. I wanted this is what I wanted to show you. Every year, thousands of new icebergs appear in Greenland, some of which reach a height of 15 floors above the surface of the water. Depending on the weather conditions, they can take on a different color from blue, black to turquoise, and trans be transparent like glass. So this is this is beautiful. Look at these spires here. They look kind of otherworldly. You know, very, very jagged 
spires. So, so this is ice is calved off the glacier and it takes this shape and it's not eroded away because uh, it's above the water. It's not being melted. You know, underneath the, it's very smooth, but don't forget 90% of this structure is under the water. You know, it's part of a, an ice shelf, but it's just, uh, you know, if you have pieces breaking off, cleaving off, you get these very multifaceted uh, faces, beautiful images. Um, this is uh, this is an image that I'll show you from the paper. It's showing the atmospheric river coming over to, to northwest Greenland and causing a, bringing a lot of moisture, which is causing a lot of melt on this side. Then it climbs up and crosses the divide at the maximum altitude um, the, of the surface of the ice. And then it's very dry. And then it descends down here as these foam winds. And this is hourly melt rates while this wind is occurring. Um, and, you know, five meter per second speed of the foam wind, very dry wind. And you're getting a lot of uh, ablation and loss of uh, hourly melting of the ice along this section here. This, so this is the coast of Northeast Greenland. Okay, this is from these atmospheric rivers events. This is the same image, it's beautiful museum, right? So there's all kinds of stuff, um, you know, and it changes all the time, of course. Here's, here's a beautiful image of Greenland, you know, of a ship with the uh, big hole, like an ice bridge here. And, and uh, you know, highly recommend um, that you have a look. Um, that you have have a look, okay? And it changes all the time. In fact, if I refresh, there's probably new stuff that's come on since I opened it just a few minutes ago. There you go. Uh, rare crystals, yeah, so not, not too many things. But anytime if somebody on Twitter posts with that hashtag, it appears at the top and you can see the latest. These are the top most liked and then you can see the latest. Generally, the, um, the top are, are the best because uh, you know, but it's it's good to look at both. Um, you know, there's lots of uh, very cool pictures. We're halfway to a tipping point. Uh, let's just see what else. Deep ocean currents around Antarctica. You know, some people put both hashtags, uh, so we're getting Antarctica stuff too. Okay, so let's uh, look at these studies. Okay, so this is the article that... Um, I showed at the very beginning of the video. This just came out um, a couple days ago. The Greenland ice sheet's close to a melting point of no return. This is what this is the um, ice volume of Greenland with the equivalent meters of sea level rise. So if the whole thing melted with no ice on Greenland, we basically have this curve here, um, and this is CO2 level. So if we were if we had no ice on Greenland right now, it wouldn't regrow until we go backwards to about 280 parts per million and then it would start growing over time and it would you know we'd have to be close to about 250 parts per million to completely reform it there's a, there's a hysteresis loop here's where we are right now in this curve we're tracking this curve you know we're we're uh and right now our our we're we're uh co2 levels are you know way up here okay so um, so we've actually crossed a threshold for, with CO2 already where we have a big drop here. And, and then there's also another big drop here coming. And I'll talk about those. This shows the uh, temperature, the temperature change in order f f for these things to be reached. So, you know, from this is the, so at uh, 200 and say 80 parts per million, we start climbing. Um, that would be could that could be at about today's temperature, depending on the CO two level, and then you know. But in order to um, go up here to this point, you know, we'd have to the whole sheet would be gone with these sort of temperature rises. And um, this is the um, this is what Greenland basically looks like in equilibrium. So we're over here already. So given enough time at four hundred and twenty parts per million. Basically, Greenland completely goes, okay, there, except for a little bit of ice here. And this is the ice thickness from zero to three kilometers. So this color here, you know, maybe one, maybe we reach about one and a half kilometers here. You know, that's where, that's at our CO2 level right now. 
this is a stability point so we're already marching to that for that to happen that's why we have to back off co2 levels we want to you know talk about climate restoration to get back to say 300 parts per million you know where we have an ice sheet there so this this is about this is about the the um state where we are right now um in terms of what greenland looks like you know ice is up to you know three kilometers thick in the center it it's not quite uh this is from the mo the, the model i mean there is some thicker ice here as well it goes up to about 2.75 kilometers i believe but I, I don't it doesn't appear on this image at 340 you know you lose a lot of the ice in southern greenland at 400 you lose it backs off even more and then at 420 there's a huge change and you lose the rest of this this is what the the model show so greenland ice sheet it covers 1.7 million square kilometers in the Arctic, if it melted entirely, global sea level would rise about seven meters or 23 feet. We're not sure how quickly the ice sheet will could melt. So modeling tipping, you need to model the tipping points in the climate system. Um, and those are critical thresholds, give you critical thresholds where a system behavior irreversibly changes. And then we could find out, you know, when this type of melt will occur. So the simulation identified Two, it's the most sophisticated computer simulation thus far, you know, an Earth system model trying to get the feedbacks in. And it identified two tipping points. So releasing a thousand gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere cumulatively causes the southern portion of the ice sheet to melt. So these sort of states. Um, about 2,500 gigatons of carbon means the permanent loss of nearly the entire ice sheet, okay? Um, we've emitted already up to now 500 gigatons of carbon. So we're halfway to this first tipping point. And these tipping points are, you can see here, this is the first tipping point right here. This is the second tipping point. So 500 more um, gigatons of carbon and we basically tip. And uh, this would require 2,500 um, gigatons of carbon. And once we tip, we can't just back it off a little bit. The ice isn't going to regrow until we back it off a huge amount. So it's pretty much irreversible, at least on human time scales. Okay, the first tipping point is not far from today's climate condition, so we're in danger of crossing it. Um, once we start sliding, we'll fall off the cliff and cannot climb back up. The Greenland ice sheet's already melting very fast. Between 2003 and 2016, it lost about 255 gigatons. A gigaton is a billion tons of ice every year. Much of the melt to date has been in the southern part of the ice sheet. Of course, factors like air and water temperature, ocean currents, precipitation, and other factors all determine how quickly the ice sheet melts and where it loses ice. And I'll, I, I'm going to talk a bit about atmospheric rivers causing the foam winds and, and how that's also affecting the melt. And a lot of the melt that's occurring is happening during those events. So these factors all influence each other. Um, you know, along with the long time scale scientists need to consider for melting an ice sheet of this size, it makes it difficult to predict how the ice sheet will respond to different climate and carbon emission scenarios. So previous research identified global warming of between one degree to three degrees Celsius, that's 1.8 to 5.4, we're already at 1.1 or 1.2, as the threshold beyond which the Greenland ice sheet will melt irreversibly. So this uh, new study, it uses a complex model of the whole Earth system. So, an, uh, you know, an Earth system model. It includes all the key climate feedback processes paired with a model of ice sheet behavior. So they first used simulations with constant temperature to find out where the equilibrium states of the ice sheet were, or points where ice loss equals ice gain. And then they ran 20,000 year long simulations with carbon emissions ranging from zero to 4,000 gigatons of carbon. So that's how they found the 1,000 gigaton carbon tipping point for the melting of the southern portion of the ice sheet and even the even more perilous 2,500 gigaton carbon tipping point for losing the whole ice sheet. So, you know, come back to these diagrams here. Okay, this is reached, we're halfway to this point. 
and uh, you know we're heading to this point. This is a loss of almost the whole ice sheet. This is a loss of the southern part of the ice sheet. So C is here, this point here is here, and B is this point here is here, and here's where we are. So we can go from here to here, you know, fairly, uh, fairly without much uh, increase in carbon. Um, as the ice sheet melts, of course, there's feedbacks coming in because as it melts, the surface is at lower and lower elevations. As you go to lower elevations, uh, then the, you get warmer air temperatures, right? Because of the lapse rate. You know, as you go up in the atmosphere, temperature drops. As you go down towards the surface, temperature rises. So as the surface of the ice sheet goes to warmer and warmer, lower lower altitude regions, the uh, that's, that's a, a height um, feedback, if you like, accelerating feedback. Warmer air temperatures accelerate melt, making it drop and warm further. And then you, you know, you get melting on the surface and that water, that water then drips off the edges of the ice sheet or goes under the ice sheet, goes out to the ocean, causes this dynamic loss, um, right? It accelerates the submarine or underwater melting. Um, you know, if there was a clip, quick blip of two degrees Celsius, it, it wouldn't trigger it. It takes the temperature and time, okay? But once the ice crosses the threshold, it would continue to melt even if atmospheric CO2 is reduced to pre-industrial levels, it wouldn't be enough for the ice sheet to regrow. Okay, so we can't continue carbon emissions at the same rate uh, for much longer without risking crossing these tipping points. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on. And this is just a new paper. Um, let's have a look at some things first. So this is a topographic map of Greenland. This is what you find under the uh, Greenland ice. If I, I just went to Google Images and Google, Google Greenland topographic map. Um, so we get, uh, you know, this is one of the images here. That, so if all of the ice melted on Greenland, this is what you're left with for the continent. And you could see that, uh, you know, these areas here are so low, they're below sea level, they would fill with water. Not a lot of water. I mean, this scale here is maybe to 2000 meters. Um, I think the deepest spots are something like, uh, yeah, something like that, uh, you know, a couple thousand meters, couple kilometers. Um, so this is what it would look like. This is another image, um, sort of 3D image showing you what Greenland looks like, um, you know, de depressed in the center, right? You know, of course, ice is covering this whole thing. If the ice is to go, this is the topography. Of course, uh, sea level, you know, would be higher if the ice was melting. You know, it would, it would fill in this region as I showed in this previous uh, image. And this is what Greenland's like now. Um, so the summit is about 3,000 meters or three kilometers high. And there's also a saddle point here um, where there's a saddle here where we got a peak here, a, a dip, and then a rise here. This, I think the topographic, uh, the lines are 250 meters. So, so this is about 2750, you know, slightly higher. It doesn't reach uh, three kilometers. Okay, I pointed that out in the images. They, the, they don't show this, this region, but that's what it looks like um, right now. And, uh, you know, you can play around on uh, Google Earth and, uh, you know, you can see uh, look at if as you move your cursor, it shows you the um, it shows you down at the bottom there three thousand three kilometers in this region. Okay, so you can play around. Uh, you know three thousand. Uh, I got three thousand four hundred and seven meters was the highest I saw. Something like that is about the highest. I can go this way. I can go this way. Okay, so you can see. You know, and then down in this region, it was pretty high. There was one part that was pretty high, right? So you can see, you can basically um, play around and, and try to, you know, find out, you know, you learn a lot. It's just playing, basically. You learn most when you're playing. So the vast ice sheet is facing the climate fight on two fronts. So this is, a, this is an article which came out a few months ago, uh, October of 2022. And basically, the, the ice sheet is more vulnerable than it than we thought because rising air temperatures amplify the effects of melting caused by ocean warming, leader, leading to greater ice loss for the world's second largest ice sheet. Previous studies have shown that rising air and ocean temperatures both cause the Greenland ice sheet to melt, but one intensifies the effects of the other. 
Okay, so this is the example. If you've got ice cubes in a glass um, there you, and measure the melt rate and then repeat the experiment, but now stir the water or shake the water, um, the melting is much faster because of the dynamic effect. So the same thing is happening in Greenland. The amplification occurs when warm air temperatures melt the surface of the ice, generating meltwater. The meltwater flowing into the ocean creates turbulence and that results in more heat melting the edges of the ice sheet, the so-called submarine melting. So this was done um, from a period, they looked at data from 1979 to 2018 um, and they looked at submarine melting all along the coast. And I actually uh, did a video of this uh, paper, um, you know, uh, back when it first came out um, in October of last year. Um, so they looked at the, so the air temperature has had almost as much impact on ocean, as ocean temperature on submarine melting. Okay, in other words, you know, air temperature goes up, of course, much faster than ocean temperature and the submarine melting greatly increases because of that dynamic runoff effect, the stirring of the ice cube effect. Okay, so the Greenland ice sheet is much more sensitive to climate change than we think. Okay, so that was the article. And now let's look at the, um, now I'm gonna look at the three papers, um, the, the three key papers. So this is the one that just came out. Um, these are all uh, open source. They're all, you can have a look at them. And then, uh, then this one here was the one I already talked about in a video back when it came out in October but I'll just remind you of it. Um, this is how the melt water, the surface melting amplifies the ocean melting. Um, and then this paper just came out actually, uh, it came online just yesterday. In the increase, there's increasing extreme melt in the Northeast of Greenland. And that's because the atmospheric rivers come, they hit the Northwest of Greenland. They, as they rise up the ele to higher elevations, they get drier and drier because they lose their water vapor. You know, snow usually, maybe a bit of rain. They reach the top and then they descend down the other side to the northeast um, and they're dry air. And as they descend, they get warmer and accelerate. And these are the so-called phone winds and they're causing lots of melt in northeast Greenland when these events occur. So that's the third paper I'm going to talk about um, just the highlights, basically. Okay, so this is a paper, the new paper I haven't discussed uh, yet. And uh, so basically, um, to understand the future fate of the Greenland ice sheet in the context of climate change, anthropogenic CO2 emissions, we need to know that to predict sea level rise. So they use a fully coupled Earth system model of intermediate complexity. Right, there's always a trade-off. If you have uh, really complex models, it takes forever to run them on the computer. So you have to, if you want to model a whole system, you have to try to um, parameterize some things. And so it's called intermediate complexity. So they're studying the stability of the Greenland ice sheet and its transient response to CO2 emissions. Bifurcation points exist at global temperature anomalies of 0.6 and 1.6 K relative to pre-industrial. So here we are, we're about 1.1 right now. Um, you know, again, what are they using for pre-industrial? They're probably talking about the 1850 to 1910 average, right? So we're already much, much higher, you know, then we'd be instead of 1.1, we're 1.1 relative to that 1850 to 1900 average, we'd be about 1.3 already, or 1.4 relative to the 1750 pre-industrial average. But I, I don't want to talk about that too much right now. Anyway, point we're already past this, and we're we're rapidly approaching this. Um, so if so, the model basically shows that these are critical temperatures that are reached, and these are we these are reached um, these critical ice volumes. Um, in the vicinity of the equilibrium ice volumes corresponding to these temperature anomalies, mass loss rate and sensitivity of mass loss to cumulative CO2 emissions peak. So basically, cumulative emissions of 1,000, and we passed the first tipping point, 2,500, and we passed the second. So if we pass the first one, uh, we get about 1.8 meters of sea level rise, southern Greenland goes, you know, and we're already, we've, we've already emitted um, 500 gigatons of carbon. That's where we're at right now. We're halfway to this one, to losing all the ice on Southern Greenland. Um, if we 
hit this number, we'd lose all of Greenland basically, and there'd be a seven meter sea level rise, okay? So basically the key points of the paper are we get these bifurcation points or rapid uh, nonlinear um, tipping points at 0.6 and 1.6. We've already passed the 1.6, the 0.6 rather. Um, the mass loss rate and sensitivity to cumulative CO emission peak near the equilibrium of ice volumes belonging to these temperature um, uh, anomalies, which that, that's a key point. Mass loss rate and sensitivity to cumulative CO emission peaks near... Uh, okay, uh, so they've actually, well, they've determined that. I think there's, they should have added, changed, you know, the writing here is not so good. Basically, you get substantial long-term mass loss of Greenland ice sheet for cumulative emissions larger than 1,000 gigatons of carbon. We've already emitted 500. Okay, so, so this is just going into all of the, the details here. Um, mass loss of Greenland ice sheets, one of the main contributors to sea level rise. We've lost uh, mass at a rate of 255 gigatons a year between 2003 and 2016. Um, freshwater flux from the mass loss, it affects the, the AMOC, the Atlantic Marinal Overturning Circulation. A substantial weakening or even complete shutdown of the AMOC would have dramatic consequences for the environmental conditions of, of our planet. In the next video, when I'm talking about Antarctica, I'll be talking about the effect of the, of the uh, warming deep water slowing the AMOC slowing the thermohaline circulation in the southern hemisphere which is linked to the amoc in the northern hemisphere okay uh you know with the change of the amoc we could uh you know we lose stability probably of the amazon rainforest and we get uh you know we get a cooling temporary cooling of the north atlantic you know we get a hu huge nonlinear effect so the surface mass balance elevation feedback all right, that's as you go to elevate, lose ice, go to lower elevations, temperatures warmer. It's a very highly nonlinear response of the Greenland ice sheet to temperature rise, right? An increase in surface melt results in widespread thinning. So the ice is not as thick, it's at lower elevation. So it's exposed to higher air temperature, which then leads to more melting and further thinning. Okay, so that's a huge, uh, you know, feedback occurring in, in Greenland. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the EMIC acronym, that's Earth Model of Intermediate Complexity. That's the computer model that's used. They talk about the methods of how they did it, running the model, and then the results. Uh, let's just look at the results, which is basically these the stability diagram. So this is a stability diagram. It shows equilibrium states of the green and ice sheet as a function of atmospheric CO2 concentration for initial conditions of a pre-industrial Greenland ice sheet. So this is a pre-industrial Greenland ice sheet conditions. And then this, the red, is a completely ice-free Greenland ice sheet situation. And, uh, you know, this shows you the trajectory of it as you increase uh, CO2. And this, you know, they run it to till there's a stability point. And this is the temperatures associated with each of the locations on this curve. Um, and then the ice, the look of the ice sheet at A, B, C, D is shown here. Okay, so A at 320 still is stable. We're, of course, at 420 right now. So given enough time, this is what we would eventually, uh, you know, what we're heading towards. Um, and you can see, you know, at this point here from A to B, we lose most of the southern part of the ice sheet. It, it, it goes up more and more. The ice retreats more and more. Um, at 400, and then there's only a little bit left on this side. This is what, what it will look like, um, you know. So, so that's um, basically generated from the models. Um, transient response. Okay, so they ran all these different models where they showed this is the atmospheric CO2 in ppm. If you gave it a pulse of CO2, how long would it take for the ice sheet to go? Um, I think these times are much too generous. Um, this is the temperature anomaly over time. Uh, this is the Greenland ice volume in terms of meters of sea level equivalent. So up to like seven, seven and a half, well, seven, 7.5 meter here. 
although it only ends at two here, the time to do it and so on. So these are, you know, graphs from the models. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details of that. Basically, um, basically, you know, it compares the, the results from this Earth system model to some other work, complete melting of the green and ice sheet between 2,500 and 3,000 gigatons of carbon, cumulative emissions, and so on. Um, so basically, they looked at connections between the equilibrium states, right? They, they set a temperature, they looked at what the equilibrium state would be, then they looked at the mass loss and the time between these states. They found uh, basic, when they say four equilibrium states within a global temperature anomaly range between zero and 2K, two degrees, uh, right? One, two degrees, zero, 2K, you know, you could think Celsius, right? It's a relative scale. The change from zero to two K is the same as it's change from zero Celsius to two Celsius. There's just an offset factor that's Kelvin degrees Kelvin. That's Kelvin, um, the Kelvin uh, units. Bifurcation points were found between temperature anomalies of 0.6 and 0.9, and between 1.6 and 2. So we're we've already blown past here, right? We're already at 1.1 pre-industrial. Again, look at you need to look at what they define as pre-industrial. But between 1.6 and 2, we're heading to a complete loss of the Greenland ice sheet. Um, for cumulative emissions larger than 1,000 gigatons carbon, we're already halfway there, right? Our cumulative is 500. The committed sea level is 1.8 meters just from Greenland alone. Over 2,500 gigatons carbon, we get almost complete Greenland ice sheet melt which is seven meters of sea level rise. Okay, so this is a new paper. It caused a, quite, you know, quite a bit of stir in the last uh, few days. Um, this is a paper that came out in, uh, in uh, October, which I have a whole separate video on. I just want to remind you that they looked at the, they reconstructed the rate of submarine or underwater melting at Greenland's marine terminating glaciers from 1979 to 2018 and they estimated the resulting dynamic mass loss. Okay, so the dynamic mass loss is the mass loss of the ice underneath the water um, that is actually due to the meltwater on the surface running either off of the surface of Greenland at the end of the, uh, you know, where the calving's occurring, or running through, um, running, melting its way, drilling its way through the ice, coming to the bedrock, and then running along the interface between the uh, bottom of the ice and the bedrock into the ocean. And both things, um, I'll just show you some of the, the plots here. So this is the sort of thing, you'll probably, you might remember this diagram. So you can have surface melting, it could run right off the end, but generally it, it works its way, drills its way through to the bottom of the ice, and you get these cracks opening up, and then it runs, it's a subglacial discharge. And, uh, you know, then, then it, it mixes turbulently with the uh, ocean water and you can get these plumes coming up. And what it does is this uh, turbulent motion here, it, it, it eats away at the ice underneath here. So you get a uh, submarine melting of the ice like this. So you can look at that. So this is showing you where the ice, where the water is running off. Um, the ocean thermal forcing, you know, the ocean temperatures, right, greatest down here. Um, and then they go right underneath the ice. Of course, as you go up further north, the water's colder. And then you get the submarine melt rate um, is in the boxes. So it's highest in the in these regions here, yellows and yellows and brown and green. And up here, it's lower, the water's colder, but you still get, it depends, of course, on these discharges of water. Um, okay, submarine melt rates um, meters per day with the grounding line depth. So uh, you can see that, uh, you know, the water that's running underneath the ice as you go, uh, you know, to um, as the when the ice is grounded very deep down, uh, you can actually have uh, higher melt rates because of this uh, turbulent uh, dynamic mixing effect. Okay, and there's all kinds of images here of all of Greenland melting and different regions, south, uh, cent center, west, northwest, different parts of Greenland. Um, and 
normalized retreats from all of Greenland and from the different regions. Atmosphere, atmospheric heat varies, ocean temperature varies, they both vary, right? So in combination, because the ocean's rising in temperature and the, um, your, the melt rate is also increasing greatly because the atmospheric temperature is rising combined, you get, uh, you know, very, very high, dy you know, dynamic sea level contribution, very, very high melt rates, etc. Okay, so I talked about this uh, paper in, in great detail um, a couple of months ago, but it's very pertinent here uh, to what's happening. And also, this is the effect. Um, this is a brand new paper, just hot off the presses. So we're getting extreme melt in northeast Greenland, and that's linked to these Foehn winds, which are generated from atmospheric rivers coming across into the north northwest of Greenland. Okay, so just the abstract. The Greenland ice sheet's been losing mass at an increased rate in recent decades. In northeast Greenland, increasing surface melt has accompanied speed-ups in the outlet glaciers of the northeast Greenland ice stream, which contain over one meter of sea level rise potential. The most intense northeast Greenland melt events are driven by atmospheric rivers affecting northwest Greenland, and then they rise up past the divide over the top of the ice and they come down on the other side, on the east side. They're very dry, so-called foam winds. You know, if you want to see what foam winds are, they're warm and dust dry, gusty wind that periodically descends the leeward slopes of nearly all mountains and mountain ranges. Okay, so think of California, Sierra Nevada, the atmospheric river climbs up, deposits all its rain at lower elevation, snow in the mountains, and then it has to go over the top and it's lost most of its moisture. So then it comes down on the other slope, the leeward slope, and it's a dry, gusty wind. And as it descends, it, it warms up adiabatic heating. Okay, so that's the idea of the phone winds. So near low elevation outlet glaciers in the northeast, 80 to 100% of the extreme melt. Now extreme melt is in the 99th percentile, higher than the, okay, greater than 99th percentile. 80 to 100 percent of the extreme melt occurs during phone conditions, 50 to 75 percent during atmospheric rivers. These events have become more frequent during the 21st century, with 5 to 10 percent of total northeast Greenland melt in several recent summers occurring during the 1 percent of times with strong AR and phone conditions. We conclude that the combined atmospheric river phone influence on northeast Greenland extreme melt will likely continue to grow as regional atmospheric moisture content increases with climate change. Okay, so I talked all about atmospheric rivers and its effect on California. These things are extending up into the Arctic and they're um, greatly contributing to the melt in uh, Greenland, both directly um, you know, if they're dropping rain on the, and they're, if they're approaching from the, to the north um, west side of Greenland and depositing rain, that can be rain on snow and greatly increase melt rates. Then as they pass the peak of, of, of the ice sheet, the, the uh, ice sheet on Greenland, then they dump most of their moisture. They descend as a phone wind and they cause melting um, on the in northeast Greenland and huge melting. So it's only in, you know in the one percent of condi of time when these things are happening, you can get you know ten percent of of the melt occurring in the whole summer from just that very small time frame, just that major event. So so uh, you know after there was unprecedented ice sheet melt in all of Greenland, if you recall, in July 2012. Um, and uh, there's been major melt events since then that are affecting no northern Greenland. And uh, Greenland's lost 3.9 billion tons of ice since 1992, contributed about a centimeter to global sea level rise. 50% is attributed to surface mass loss due to increased meltwater runoff. Um, it's mostly in the southern Greenland, but we're also getting massive melt events in northern Greenland now. Okay, so east of the northern Greenland orographic divide, solid ice flow is dominated by the fast-flowing northeast Greenland ice stream. 
and it drains 16% of Greenland ice sheet, terminates at three primary marine outlet glaciers collect that contain over one meter of potential sea level rise. So the, okay, so these extreme melt events are happening more and more often because of these phone winds. Um, so let's have a look at the results. So I showed you in Twitter, this was one of the images. So you can see the atmospheric river event coming up here. And this area is expanded here. And you can see the hourly melt rates in millimeters water equivalent all along the coastline of Greenland. The phone winds, the dry winds coming down are causing, you know, they're heating up adiabatically as they descend to lower elevations and they're taking out, they're, they're greatly increasing the melt rates in this entire region. Okay, um, this is showing um, atmospheric river landfalls and then a day later two days later the melting and this is the um this is the 99th percentile melting you know regions are shaded here so basically this is a very this is a huge effect okay these atmospheric rivers uh this is showing uh summer june july august atmospheric river intensity and the magnitude of surface melt so this is the ivt i talked about that last video when I was talking about atmospheric rivers in California, right? The IVT levels set basically the class of atmospheric river. Um, so this is 100 to 200, you know, greater than 500. And this is the melt in gigatons per day, you know, ranging from about one to four gigatons per day melting. Um, this is the median. And, uh, you know, this is with, uh, with a significant atmospheric river event. This is from one paper, and this is um, from a second paper, okay? So different, different methodology, but still, you know, you can get, you know, this is about 1.5 to about four, you know, huge melting from the atmospheric river events. So increasing atmospheric rivers are driving extreme melt during the past two decades of Greenland. So let's have a look at some more data. This is an atmospheric river landfall in northwest Greenland. And then um, it generates these phone winds. And you can just see, you know, the peak atmospheric river phone impact event. Like these are these are the um, the temperatures at the different elevations. And then you can so you can get these massive um, melting. Um, this shows uh, millimeters of water equivalent per hour melt at, the, at various uh, regions. This is June, July, August mean melt. Okay, and now when you have uh, phones, the, these phones occurring, then you get much, much higher melting and it's more widespread. It goes inland quite a bit. Um, and uh, this is all melting and this is uh you know certain times when the phone is uh the ar slash phone is in operation you get extreme melt rates okay huge melt rates on the coast and uh there's some sort of time lag between when the ar hits and when the when the uh, maximum melt rate occurs so basically um this is not good news um this is uh, no AR, no atmospheric river, no phone, June, July, August, the normal situation, you know, so there's the spikes of, of AR frequency percentage, uh, of you know, uh, atmospheric river frequency percentage of the time. So they're happening more and more often, you know, as the climate warms. And when there is an event, the melt rate is much, much higher. Okay, um, and there's other there's other supporting data here, but uh, yeah. So, but what have I shown you here? Um, I'm talking all about Greenland melt, right? Join Twitter, look at the hashtag Greenland. You know, look at the what's going on. I'm talking about the ice sheet being close to a melting point of no return. That paper um, I showed you what Greenland looks like. The, the topography when there's gonna when there's no ice. Uh, the ice where it is now, um, as we as the ice melts and we get lower and lower elevations, we get the strong elevation feedback because temperatures are warmer at lower lower elevations. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, you know, we're getting melting above, melting below, 
they're combining. And so this looks at the melting, you know, it, it figures that with a thousand cumulative gigatons of carbon, uh, we cross this tipping point and we're halfway there. We're at 500, although the, 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 um, the levels of, of CO2 are already such that they're much, much higher, right? I mean, we're already here. This is the level of CO2. So the other things just follow over a long period of time. Um, and uh, yeah, so I showed you, um, I'm not sure why it, uh, uh, let's reset. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Why did it even, where did my paper go? Right here. This is my paper. I guess I clicked on the, on the image. So yeah, so basically, and then I talked about uh, the other paper of submarine melting, which came out recently, and the paper just that came out uh, just yesterday, talking about the atmospheric river and phones, and it fits in nicely with uh, the last video, which I where I talked about the the atmospheric rivers. So thanks for listening. Um, yeah, melt rates are continuing to increase. So you know, how do you make a prediction? And you know, so. These sort of things, plus in combination with the Antarctic stuff I'll talk about in the next video, you know, uh, sure, right? seven meters of sea level rise by 2070. I'll, I'll stick by it. I said that a couple of years ago. It's probably crazy, but what the heck? It's what, what my best guess would be, you know, a few years ago, what my best guess still is. Okay, well, thank you for listening. Please consider going to my um, paulbeckwith.net uh, website, um, clicking on PayPal and... Uh, sending a few bucks my way to support my research and um, videos as I connect the dots on abrupt climate system change. Thanks again, and uh, yeah, we'll chat again soon. Bye for now.